I'm Bart Simon. I'm an associate professor in, of sociology at Concordia University. And I am also the founder, co-founder and director of the Amelia Institute for Arts, Culture and Technology. Um, and I do research uh, around the cultural economy of uh, games and game development, especially indie games um, and game studies in general. So that the history of the video game industry is, is long and complicated. I think one of the interesting things to think about is how young, relatively young it is relative to other kinds of culture industries. So, uh, you know, the, the story of games really doesn't get going until, well, kind of the late 70s. So most people remember arcades uh, and early console games, which defined kind of what video games were and what video game culture was all about. Um, and there was a famous period uh, in the early 80s, they call it the video game crash. So I'm going to talk about the pre-crash period, but uh, basically the story was, uh, if you remember these old consoles, uh, Nintendo and uh, PlayStation, Famicom, all the other, there were so many consoles. Uh, and every kid kind of had one of these little things, but uh, what happened was that the market started to get oversaturated with sort of like uh, low cost, high production budget games. Um, and the bottom kind of fell out of the market and, uh, and uh, video games stopped selling in that form for, for a little while. Um, what then happened was the sort of terrain was cleared and a bunch of different uh, kind of uh, forms started appearing. So video games on consoles came back, uh, video games on PC, uh, which had always been there, but started becoming <clears throat> a dominant way of playing games. Um, uh, handhelds of various kinds like Game Boy and, and all the rest. Uh, eventually we get them on mobile phones. So a lot of the history uh, and the history of, the uh, of games is the history of the technology, the history of the the sort of, sort of production formations, the organizations that go with the particular technologies. So for instance, console gaming favors very large, um, what we call AAA, large studio production houses, uh, kind of modeled on Hollywood basically, which is what the early models were. So these are multinational corporations, uh, largely based in Japan or in the US, there's a couple in Europe. Um, and uh, they sort of work as production publishers or producer publishers. Um, and, and they also acquire smaller studios uh, as their business model. So, so anybody making a game that fits a console like Sony's PlayStation or something like that, um, on the one hand, you can license the game and, and um, you know, Sony will publish it uh, for their console and pay you money if you make a game and publish it. Or if they really like it, they'll just buy your studio and make it part of the, the, the overall multinational. So a, a lot of game production proceeded in that way. And so uh, you ended up with this universe of very, very large companies, very much like Hollywood, and very, very small ones that would sort of do work for hire or other kinds of um, small scale work. All that changed uh, probably in the early 90s. Um, and the PCs work, by the way, so PC games or games on computers work pretty much the same way. Um, they just weren't as worth as much money. Um, and so the, the model, the business model was dominated by the console game market for a very long time. In the 90s, <clears throat> the iPhone appeared um, and the App Store appeared, the, uh, the Apple App Store. Um, and there were always sort of small mobile games and things like that around, but what changed was the form of distribution and the form of publication. So now people could publish their own games. You didn't have to go through a third party publisher uh, in terms of scale. So the games were uh, cheaper to make. <clears throat> they could be uh, distributed by the maker. Um, uh, and what happened there was it was a huge boom, came with the technology. So everybody was adopting this technology, needed things to do with their iPhones besides call people because they could do so much more. Games became the dominant uh, kind of medium for these phones. So it created a huge new market uh, and that created basically the indie game sector as we know it um, because you could have an individual who is creative making something 
Uh, and even though <clears throat> they're selling their stuff at very, very, very cheaply, 99 cents uh, in the end, they didn't start that way. <clears throat> Games on the uh, on the App Store started in the sort of $10 range and they slowly came down over time. <clears throat> But then, um, but basically, uh, economy of scale meant you could make a living. So you're a small scale developer, uh, one person, two people, three people, maybe up to 10 or a dozen, uh, making all of these uh, mobile games. Um, and through economies of scale, you, you start to make a living and some become very, very successful. Eventually, very large mobile game developers start to appear. So, uh, you know, games like Candy Crush are being made by, uh, I mean, it, it's part of the Scandinavia's uh, sort of digital economy success story is that these tiny mobile game developers became like major multi-billion dollar uh, industries. Um, and uh, and at the same time, the, the thing that happened with the console games back in the crash in the 80s started happening with mobile games because there was too many games being sold too cheaply bottom starts falling out of the market, the, the people that get hit the hardest are the independent game developers and start going out of business. So for instance, in Vancouver uh, was a hotbed of the mobile game, the indie mobile game industry through the early nineties. Um, and it was fast becoming probably compare, even compared to Quebec, which is historically the sort of root of game production in Canada, Vancouver was uh, basically coming on very, very, very quickly in the early 90s and tons and tons of indie game developers uh, could be found there. Um, and then towards the um, basically, uh, you know, the, so this is the early, two, so this is the early 2000s and sort of mid, you know, 2010-ish, everything started to collapse. What we're left with today is a mishmash of uh, all sorts of things. Um, so uh, prices for games have stayed low, um, but they now uh, are, there's a broader ecology. So even if you look on the app store, you'll see a bit more of a range than you used to even five years ago. So there's still plenty of 99 cent kind of things, uh, but then there's like a $6 range and the $12 range all the way up to $30 range for some kinds of games. Um, and that's a good way to understand like the, the sort of ecosystem as it's developed, um, because that's true in the PC game market, that's true in the console game market to a certain extent, um, where different kinds of games with different kinds of markets um, find different kinds of price points and the price point determines the business model. Um, so very low price point uh, are things like free to play games. So you make a game, you're basically uh, putting it out there for free or next to free, um, and you're absorbing the production costs in the hopes of gaining an audience um, who is going to pay for extra things um, that go with your game or next installments or something along those lines, as opposed to console game making where you're hoping to recoup your, your costs more upfront. So you pay, you know, 60 bucks for one of those games and you need to sell enough to recoup the huge production costs that go in it. So it's that and everything in between. So there is no one business model, even for indies. Um, and that's one of the things I think makes the game sector so interesting um, is actually the range of different business models um, and how even inside of uh, a local economy like Montreal, there's um, all sorts of different ways of making games and making money from games from, from different sizes of studio and, and producers. Um, the dominant mode now, so it's shifted a lot from free to play, especially for what I call the, the indie game producers, because um, they started to realize it's very hard to make a living that way. Um, and so the mode has shifted a little bit. So now you'll pay more for indie games um, and it's sort of a bit in between. So you won't pay the premium price you're paying for a AAA game. Um, and at the same time, indie game producers use uh, a lot of crowdsourcing uh, for their production costs. Uh, so GoFundMes and all the rest um, or um, uh, the CMF, so Canadian Media Fund, and other kinds of um, funds that will per will basically get you to your first game. 
then you get your first game out, hopefully recouping enough costs to make the next game. Um, and then there's different ways of recouping the costs. So it's direct sales um, or a deal with a publisher uh, or uh, something like the old free to play model where, where the game is quite uh, uh, is less expensive, but the additional features of being part of the, uh, of the game community cost more money or something along those lines. What's interesting to me is that nobody has the recipe. There are plenty of people out there that are trying to sell the, the recipe for how to, how to monetize stuff online. Um, consultants everywhere, gurus everywhere, books everywhere. Um, but it's very clear that short history of, of uh, the game industry with its changing technologies, changing markets and changing uh, genres and content, there's no one kind of way to think about how one actually makes money online. Um, and the other thing is that the technologies for monetization are also changing all the time. Um, and uh, all sorts of new schemes sort of develop for figuring out how to either take um, like tiny slices of the entire production chain and turn that into money or like, is it gonna be, I make a thing and then I like market the thing and I sell the thing and, and it's sort of more or less traditional. Or is there no, all these non-traditional ways of thinking about monetization? What has definitely happened, I'd say, in the sort of uh, last, I guess, last five or six years with the rise of sort of streaming, live streaming, and YouTubers and influencers and so on and so forth, is that uh, aside from what used to be all about sort of um, advertising revenue by putting games associated with certain kinds of online platforms, right? So it's all about uh, um, influencers generating advertising revenue and so on and so forth. The other thing that's happening is people are getting used to paying subscription fees or um, uh, paying for digital content directly as opposed to indirectly um, through like, uh, you know, advertising or um, like the big platform subscriptions or something like that. So um, one of the reasons why the sort of crowdsourcing has worked so well in the game sector and probably less well in other sectors like music and film uh, has a lot to do with the cultivation of this sort of audiences that are, feel themselves deeply, deeply involved in the worlds of the, of the producers, of the makers. Um, so that when it's time to make a game, they become invested in the project as well as the product, right? Um, and that, I think, is having an influence through other kinds of uh, digital forms as well. So I actually think uh, crowdsourcing in film and in music is probably borrowing tangentially from cultures of crowdsourcing in games, which is where crowdsourcing really works. Um, it, I'm, I'm sh it works in film and in music, but it doesn't nearly work as well. <laughs> Talking about digital as a homogeneous or not homogeneous category. Um, yeah, how to approach this topic. Um, so this is one of the things uh, that when you're doing research or thinking about uh, purely digital media or born digital media, you come to realize very, very quickly that, that arguments for one digital form don't necessarily apply to another digital form. So we have to be very, very attentive to specific differences. So technology, uh, the technology, the platform, for instance, uh, becomes super important. So like I said, the difference between a console game and a PC game um, and a handheld game um, really, really matters for thinking about uh, the entire production cycle and, and, and all the way from like uh, sort of the, the most creative. <laughs> so that the moment of creation, when one is thinking about what one wants to make, you want you immediately have to take into account the platform that you're working with, the, the kinds of technologies that you're working with. This is crucial in game design. So it isn't a sort of thing where I like, I can come up with a, 
a great game idea and then I'll just immediately translate it to whatever technology happens to be around me, um, whichever is convenient or whichever looks like it'll make me the most money. The game, the, the form of the, of the game actually changes, uh, the content changes with the form. Um, and so becoming attentive to the sort of heterogeneity of digital forms, especially as that's increasing, not decreasing, um, uh, becomes becomes really, really important. Okay, just on the topic of art makers in the nonprofit sector thinking about digital games. And so um, I think there's two, two important things and we can pick up on either thread, um, but two important things. So one, one thread, and this is related to the audiences. So one thread has to do with what I'd call strong interactivity or what some people have called strong interactivity. Um, and that's more than about pressing buttons. Uh, so, so you can make anything interactive uh, by having a start button, like on a, <laughs> a video, you know, a video cassette player, you could press start, that's interactive. Um, uh, watching or not watching is interactive, but that's a weekly interactive. Strongly interactive is when um, in order to consume or even make sense of the content, um, the, the audience or player uh, needs to engage um, with, with the game or with the medium, with the film. Um, that, it, that its meaning only resides in the direct relationship between the audience member and, and the creator in this sense. Games fundamentally work this way. Lots of other art production also works this way, but not necessarily so. Um, so this is a crucial thing because games have no choice. Uh, games, that you can make a game that's very cinematic. There are plenty of AAA games that are super cinematic, it's basically like watching a, a really big movie and they, they have lots of cut scenes and you sit there at your, at your computer and you watch the cool stuff that goes on and you press a button to move to the next scene. Or maybe it's like, a, you know, choose your own adventures, like press A to go that way and press B to go that way and see what happens. But you don't decide what happens. It's already been decided. You're just choosing one of several threads or something like that. I don't think anybody sort of, has a sense that that's like part particularly original or, or special to, to how games work. There's lots of different forms that work that way. Um, I mean, certainly text did it first, um, but that's not strongly interactive and it's not at the core uh, of what strong interaction is. Um, strong interaction where people have to like move around um, in kind of open world spaces where um, there's many different stories or that the author, the, the creator themselves don't know what the, the narrative outcome of the engagement's going to be. Um, these are closer to strongly interactive games. Um, the consequence of strong interactivity often is a, a level of commitment and, and uh, engagement, not just in the game, but to the whole process of creation. So people who become deeply invested and deeply involved in a game also tend to become deeply involved in the process of creation of the game. They start thinking and caring about creation and the creator. Um, and that produces a kind of audience that's very different than I think your average, say, theater going audience or a film audience or something like that. So it's possible for film audiences and music, music audiences to be, become fans and followers of, of a given artist or something like that. But game making audience, uh, game playing audiences don't tend to work. I mean, there's, there's fandoms, uh, but it's deeper than that. It's more like interactive investments. So the the, the world of the game becomes the world of the, of the audience member. Um, and the games, I feel like the game's uh, context, right? Everything that leads to the ability to play that game becomes part of that world. Um, and so you get a level, I think, of engagement um, in game audiences that can only be dreamed about um, by other kinds of artists. Um, and sometimes I, that goes badly. <laughs> um, that, that, that's like with relationships with all audiences, I think it can be problematic in terms of what audiences expect, desire, want, need, and so on and so forth, and how to navigate those things. And I'm 
game makers are not necessarily any better than anybody else at navigating those things. But in terms of sustainability and sort of like income stream, um, I think the audiences are, we used to say, stickier. Um, that is, they become quite connected to uh, a, a genre or a um, franchise. Um, I mean, indies don't use the word franchise, but in a sense, it, it is a franchise um, because for an indie game maker who makes a game, um, once players connect to that game, the sort of next game is kind of part of the franchise in a way. Um, the second thing uh, that I think is super, super important that other art makers I think can only dream of is the modes of distribution. Um, and so the ability to put, to put, I mean, is it so different from games? I mean, musicians can put their music right in the pockets of anybody walking around, um, no less than, than games. Um, but I think it's the, it's the, the diversity of, of, of modes of play and, and being able to, and so music is, kind of confined to, uh, I know they're all MP3s or whatever the equivalent is, um, and, and streamed, um, and there's a convergence going on. So I suspect, you know, um, you know, whether it's Apple or Netflix or the rest, everybody's going to try to put all media forms all together in one giant platform. But games, I think the lesson about games is they escape that. Um, in, in very interesting ways. Um, one of the interesting ones, uh, just as, a, as an aside, um, which is one of my areas of research, is the ability uh, to basically take a game and remake it, um, depending on a platform. So uh, if you stream a game, you know, you have no access to the, to the software. Um, you basically, you know, are looking at something that, that, that you can't actually mess with in any way. Uh, but if you buy a game, um, many, uh, I mean, many games these days open themselves up to being tinkered with and what we call modded or changed. Um, everything from like changing the way things look, which is very fairly straightforward, to changing the, the game in its entirety. Um, so one of the games I study, which is probably the most famous indie game ever made, which is called Minecraft, which is the most popular game of all time, billions and billions of dollars. It started as a very tiny little game company named Mojang in Sweden, um, then eventually was bought out by Microsoft, um, but it's still an indie game story. Um, but one of the important features that allows Minecraft to continue to be so popular is the fact that players can change that game completely. Uh, and so you ranging from like kids just playing around coding to like professional software developers creating um, new new content for these games, which continues to grow the community. Uh, so while the community, the game, the player community for Minecraft hungrily awaits every new Mojang installation of the game and they're wise to that. So they time their their new releases perfectly to uh, keep the market captured, all good business practice in the game industry. Uh, in between all that is all of this incredible pr productivity and, and generation. So there's a, there, it's not divergent, it's completely part of the ecosystem. So you're buying um, what the Mojang developers are selling, but you're also uh, part of a community which is creating new content, trading that content basically for free um, uh, and continuing to invest in the game. So is that sense that strong interactivity, these modes of distribution that'll, that facilitate like completely different kinds of audiences. It's importantly different too, right? Because you can listen to an album, let's say, you know, in our day, <laughs> back in the day, you could bring home an album and listen to the album and be so inspired and, and want to make music and all the rest. But the relationship between the album's creator and yourself is very much limited to a, a one-way relationship unless you're part of a fan community and then you go you know and be part of a fan club or something like that whereas 
in something like Minecraft, you're essentially doing the same thing. You're playing a game, you love the game, um, you know, you follow the streamers and you look for all the tips and tricks about how to play the game better and so on and so forth. But at the same time, you're part of a, a like, I guess a deep fan community, which is producing new content, which you're also consuming um, inside of that ecosystem, right? Uh, so this reciprocality, I think, is something that is happening in the digital arts, um, which I think all artists have always wanted. Um, but I think old traditions, which kind of cultivate the fourth wall, that that sort of separate um, producers and consumers in um, different kinds of cultural sectors, and that's just that's tradition. That's I think that's because these are art forms that are very old um, and this was the mode. Um, I mean, I, I guess actually there's good arguments about, you know, I remember reading stuff about even Shakespearean plays being way more interactive than they became, right? Um, as time went on and you created this sort of theater community where there's the audience in the dark and the, the actors and the creators uh, on stage and a, and a definite divide between the two of them. Um, so that, that stuff, I think digital allows that stuff to begin eroding or changing or mutating um, in interesting sorts of ways um, that, that make games instructive, I think. This is a great question and, and probably for the games sector going to be one of the interesting questions in the next five to 10 years as the sort of ecology shifts again, right? Um, so we're, we're in a situation which I think um, parallels most of the other arts at a different scale in, in the sense that the number of creators is increasing, but the slice of the pie stays about the same. So the markets aren't expanding. Uh, but the number of people trying to make games and make money from making games is increasing. So the slices, the relative slices of the pie are getting smaller. So people need to figure out how to work together. It can't just be sort of artist against artist, whoever makes it, makes it, everybody else kind of gives up. Um, nobody actually wants that. I mean, in any sector, um, it's not supposed to be this neoliberal, like, you know, cutthroat thing. That's not what the arts are founded on. Nevertheless, the economic situation drives it. Um, and it's not helped by the platform owners like Steam or Apple or anything like that. So ultimately, we just want artists to compete with one another for, for um, slices of the pie. Uh, so all these alternative funding models, hubs, and different kinds of organizations, different kinds of intermediaries, basically, um, uh, start to appear. I mean, and that's in games, that's really only started to happen recently. So um, as recently as the early 90s, it was really just producers and publishers. Um, and now we have lots in between and also um, government agencies stepping in to try and figure out how to seed um, the industry in the right ways and often getting it wrong <laughs> um, because they're uh, working off old models, old media models, and haven't quite figured out the new media models yet. The hub model or a hub model, um, how would I describe it in the games sector? Um, more and more indies organically coming together. So building from the ground up, um, indies coming together, forming kinds of limited collectives, not collectives in the share everything sense, but collectives in the sense of um, uh, doing cost efficiencies in the production process. So what indies want more than anything, just like all artists, is to have the autonomy to make what they feel is the game that they want to make. And they don't need to make millions of dollars, they need to make enough to survive just doing that. And I don't think there's any artists anywhere who just would disagree with that, that's it. I mean, it's fine if you wanna be a millionaire and celebrity and so on, but that everybody recognizes that's a very you know, distant thing and only a few people are gonna make there. But the more, more important thing is, what's the sustainability model going forward? 
So, uh, so it's about looking at the costs, right? So you're not gonna do anything about um, the core production costs that, that belongs to the artist. What does it take to make a game? But there's other sorts of costs like marketing and distribution and other aspects of building this sort of strong interactivity with the audience in the world um, that can be shared. Um, and that's starting to happen. So whether you call it like indie publishers for indie games um, or other kinds of cooperatives and collectives um, where um, skills are shared and, and uh, costs are shared um, are starting to appear. So I call that sort of ground up organic, tends to be local, tends to be urban. Um, so where there's a concentration of enough small indies in a place like Montreal or Vancouver, or Toronto, um, these sorts of things can happen because there's a kind of critical mass of people all needing to do the same sorts of things. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a way in which, uh, because it's all digital, you can do this internationally too, but it's a bit more difficult, uh, but it's certainly happening. Um, organizations, I would say, are more, uh, organizational models are more top down. Um, and it's something that I think governments want more than hubs. Um, so they would like to control the story a little bit more. So I don't know if we think of this Canadian Media Fund as a kind of organizational model, which is trying to adapt to digital um, slowly but surely. Uh, but in Canada, it is one of the most important um, uh, funders of the indie game sector there is. Um, but it's a business funding model, it's not an arts funding model. So the Indies have to go through Lord knows how many hoops to try and prove the business case for, for what they're doing, um, which I think, you know, they're no better at than most artists in terms of thinking of their art practice as business. Um, so uh, there are plenty of sort of game developers who can think business first, art second, um, but I think it's a hard sell. One of the things um, that CMF is wrestling with is sort of like, because there is no like automatic recipe to making money, you can't use business models from say the software industry or even the film industry or the television industry in the game sector, then they have to have, and there's a lack by the way of, of senior, because it's so young, there's a lack of senior game developers who can be sitting on all of these juries to like make these decisions about these businesses. It's starting to change now, but it's still very young. It's still very new. There's a lot of risk taking that needs to be required um, and getting the sort of funding levels right. Um, so often CMF, for instance, overfunds. Uh, I mean, a lot of artists like to hear this, but overfunds. Uh, first projects for indies. The consequence of overfunding, right, is, is A, less money to go around to more projects, but B, um, for uh, indies who don't know how to run a business yet, they waste a lot of money. Um, you, you're basically burning a lot of money in making your first game. So it's that kind of tuning of the funding agencies. Other kinds of funding um, would be like a venture funding, which is really rare in other arts, but is less rare in games. It's still not as big in uh, the rest of the high tech sector. So even VR gets all the venture capital and AR and all that other kind of stuff um, because it's tied to hardware. But the more it's about content on existing technology, the less venture capital can actually be sort of the, the funding model. Um, but there are interesting hybrids where uh, successful indies would come together and pool resources to create a fund, a fund to support first games of first, first time developers um, and, and do it that way. So kind of a mix of this sort of top down, bottom up model. Um, and those are just examples. So, so thinking about this, I, I actually want to think about this a lot. So I'm interested very much in comparisons between what I know about the game sector. Uh, I'm very interested in the music sector because I think that's an unexplored parallel. Um, film, we know more about like what is 
what games are like in terms of film or not like in terms of film. And, and often games are treated originally as being um, basically extended film media. So I can't remember now what's called like the, the, the tenth medium or something. Or after film comes games, after games comes VR, after whatever. Um, but basically for a long time, games were basically treated as, as film, both culturally and economically. Um, but actually, um, film is never a great model for interactivity. Um, really, even interactive films, the ones that are coming out, I wouldn't call them strongly interactive. They're still predicated on like watching and, and sort of do something and then like wait and see what happens. So my investments there, I was playing, um, uh, there's a really cool interactive film I was just messing with called Brain Streams, uh, NFB interactive so nfb interactive does really good experiments in this area but what i like to say kind of in a mean and kind way is that they're experiments um so there's no there's no sustainability model in the work that nfb interactive is is features and one of these the brain streams um it's carolyn roberts i think is the filmmaker um but it's basically a, t a kind of touch Green kind of thing, but you find yourself always just waiting to see what the filmmaker is going to do next. So your investment's not there. It's not, I, what can I do? It's like, what can I do to, to prompt something new from the filmmaker um, to get to the next cool thing that she's going to show me or something like that? That's not strong interactivity. Um, so strong interactivity is I want to do this. I, I need to do this. I've got to, I've got to explore. I've got to go here. I've got to create this. I've got to do this. Um, and you know, the, the maker, the, the artist becomes almost inconsequential. It's more like setting up the conditions of possibility for me to do stuff than the other way around. This is the frontier for me. So if I if I want to talk to art sector people about what the equivalent is in music or in theater, uh, in film, um, it would be about these kinds of audiences because I think these are the heart of what game audiences are. And I don't think it the, the game form, so we never talked about that, but but we, you know, the game form itself does not require, does not know, it's not this kind of audience isn't tied to the game form. It's tied, uh, it's much more primordial than that. Um, so, you know, as a sociologist, um, one of my big trips is that games are not media, games are uh, social interaction. And the model for thinking about games is not a film, but a game of, uh, I don't know, hopscotch in the playground genuinely social interactive where the in fact there is no maker of that game um, the game exists in some kind of vague interpretation of a set of rules that have come down through the culture but any playground game right there's no artist of the game but the players become the artists they change the rules they make up new formulations um, still art boy, is it still art, um, the things that are being made there, but it, it fundamentally not media. It's not media that's the model there, um, but a form of social interaction um, that is being displaced into media uh, that becomes very interesting. 